Today's scripture reading is from the Gospel of Matthew in the New Testament, chapter 16, verses 13 to 24. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do you people say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonna, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. From that time on, Jesus, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the ends of the elders, the priest chief, the chief priest, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said. This shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. This is God's word. There's a lesser known, lighthearted, but also pretty metaphysically on target song by the Rolling Stones called Saint of Me. You familiar with that? And, uh, you know, Mick is singing his heart out, essentially saying that you're not going to make a saint of me. I've seen what happens to saints. You know, it's a very tough life. You're not going to make a saint of me, he says. You'll never make a saint of me. And then in this, uh, frankly, hilarious segment, he says, I even see an angel cry. I thought I saw a teardrop falling from his eye. Oh, yeah. Listen, for normal people, the idea of reaching sainthood probably sounds, you know, ridiculously unrealistic. It might even sound boring to you. Until you look at the life of Peter, we're in a series. Okay, it's starting to rain, so I'm going to go underneath here now. We're in the middle of a series, and f feel free to find cover. I'm just going to keep going, all right? So we're in a series called St. Peter with a question mark because it's really trying to get at this question. When you look at Peter, when you look at a passage like this, that's one of my favorites, not only in the life of Peter, but in the entire New Testament, it's this picture of Peter at his absolute best and worst simultaneously. It's, you get sort of whiplash by seeing him ascending to the heights, but then descending down to the depths at the same time. And in the middle of this, not only do you probably sense an angel crying, maybe that's what's happening right now, but you get to learn a lot about yourself, the church, and Jesus by seeing Peter as this bedrock, Jesus affirms, but also a stumbling rock. Which one is he? First, a bedrock. So the, this passage is a like a hinge in the book of Matthew. Everything is moving up to this point. Everything is ascending to this point. Jesus has traveled all over the place, and now he takes his closest friends and followers to Caesarea Philippi, the most northerly region in Palestine, and he poses the question to them, who do the people say the Son of Man is? And their response, they give a range of responses, which shows us, the first insight about the church, shows us that they're engaging with people who don't believe precisely the same, same things they do. The church oftentimes, sadly, is this cluster of 
Christians that has isolated itself from people who don't share their beliefs, people who don't live like they do, or at least they look down their nose and suppose that to be the case. But the Christian church ought to engage culture. It ought to pursue people in humility and love so that these kinds of questions, questions that our lives should be built upon, come to the fore in those conversations. And so Jesus, who do the people say that I am? They give him different answers to this. But then he turns it on them and says, but who do you say that I am? And that's really the question. Who do you and I say that he is? And Peter, always impetuous, sometimes he gets it right. Peter nails it here. You are the Messiah or Christ. It's interchangeable. You are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Here, Peter, having traveled with Jesus to the northernmost point of Israel, Peter himself has summited. It is Peter at his best. And he's showing us that Jesus is not just a solid teacher. He's he's not just a preeminent prophet. He is Messiah. And Messiah, you may know, is a an anticipated figure throughout the pages of the Old Testament for thousands of years, the prophets were trying to see around the corner of human history to see this one who would come. The ultimate anointed one is what Messiah literally means, but it's the one who was going to come and through his presence and his ministry, he would put the brokenness of the world back together. He's going to put wrongs to right. He's going to wipe every tear from our eye. But then Peter, it's interesting because Jesus says, who do the people say the son of man is? And Peter says, the son, the Messiah, the son of the living God, right there, son of man, son of the living God. We've got the summary of who Jesus is. That Jesus, of course, Jesus is not just a good teacher. He's not just a doer of good deeds. He is The son of man, meaning he has thoroughly entered into our experience. He is empathetic. Author of Hebrews says that he's been tempted in every respect, yet he hasn't taken that next step that you and I tend to and send. But that means that the worst thought you can think of, the, the greatest struggle you have, Jesus empathizes with you in that. He's not looking down on you. He's entered into that. He's the son of man. See, he can relate to us. And yet, he is the son of the living God. He is divine. We need him to be both. We need him to be son of man so he can enter in and understand our plight. But we need him to be the son of God so he can do something about our plight. Do you see? And and that's what you get here in what Peter's affirming. And it also shows us something about what the church should be at its best. You know, the, the Bible is often misunderstood as kind of a code of conduct, a, a, a book of rules. Look, what this is showing us, what the scriptures are all moving toward in this hinge climactic moment is that Christianity, the Bible, the church are not to be about, you know, some ethical standard, some, uh, some rule book, but it's to be about who Jesus is. It's understanding and coming to terms, not just with a belief system, but the question driving throughout the Bible is, in in whom will you place your trust? And when Peter affirms this, Jesus doesn't just pat him on the back, but he actually changes his identity. He says, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven, Let me just stop right there. For those of you that struggle to believe, maybe struggle to continue to believe, this ought to encourage you because Jesus is saying, it's not an easy thing to believe. In fact, it's a miracle. He's saying that when a person can come to that point of belief, it doesn't mean you've eradicated doubts. We talked about this last Sunday, so you can go back to last Sunday if you missed it. What it means though, is that In the person of Jesus, we become new people. See, and so he goes on to say, I tell you that you are Peter, he declared it, 
and on this rock, I will build my church. So I know people call you Simon, son of Jonah, but I'm going to rename you as Peter. And you may know the word Peter in Greek, Petros means rock. I am going to name you this rock and on this rock, I'm going to build my church. Now there's, you know, all legions of disagreement over exactly how to parse that up and what it means. And different church traditions have diverged on this point. I'm not going to get into that. What I want to have you take home with you is this idea that the driving question, who, who am I? Who do you say that I am? The way you answer that has the capacity to place a rock solid foundation upon your life that you can build your life on so that when, as Jesus said at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, when the storms of life come, you're going to be beaten about, you're going to be shaken, but you won't be utterly undone because you've built your life on what? The rock solid truth of who Jesus is. He is the rock, capital R, and building your life upon him. And we can do that recognizing that our deepest sense of who, who am I? Not just who is Jesus, but who am I? I am a new person that has fashioned through the work of Jesus. You know, I've always taken comfort in this one little last part, and we're moving on to the second point. It's only a two-part sermon, don't worry. Where he said, I will build my church, and I'm not going to let anything, even, and this is, you know, an argument from the greater to the lesser, even the gates of Hades, the worst possible enemy force you can imagine, nothing is going to undermine my ability to build a church. And I've got to tell you, as someone who has been a church leader for about 30 years, I've always taken great comfort from this. I resemble Peter a lot more than I'd like to admit, not so much in his high water marks, but in his descent into the depths of impetuosity, thinking I know what's right. And oftentimes I'll make mistakes, but the great comfort that I have and the great comfort I think that you can have with the church in a day where the church has a lot of people that, are, that have been hurt and suspicious that they can ever find their way back to the church, that it's Jesus at the end of the day who is the king and head of his church. He's the one who's promised to build his church and he's not gonna let anything or anyone interfere with that work of building his church. It's his massive building project to take the broken world and put it back together in a beautiful way. And Peter is symbolic of that bedrock. Jesus calls him that. But he's also a stumbling rock. And there's, a, there's an irony and humor here. Peter must have felt pretty good about himself at this point. He thought, you know, Jesus, yeah, this is a turning point. You've taken me all the way to the north. You are the north star. I've just directed everyone there, Jesus. And now, Jesus, you're going to be soaring from one height to another. It's, there's never any turning back at this point, Jesus. You're going to... Uh, push out all the um, oppressive powers and authorities in the world through your power and dominance. And uh, that's when Jesus absolutely not only confused him, but disrupted his whole way of thinking. Jesus began to explain that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. And you just imagine, Peter's like, what in the world is going on? Suffering? The cross? The shame of the cross of all? These, these were not in the cars, Jesus. Jesus, it's like you, you have a very skewed messianic map at this point. Something's happened to your ways app. Jesus, your ways are not my ways. Jesus, you have an incredibly flawed strategic missionary plan, a mission, uh, messianic plan here. And so he actually takes Jesus aside and rebukes him, is the word. Can you imagine that? But before you roll your eyes at Peter and go, oh my goodness, I can't believe he did that. We do the same kinds of things. We just don't get it put into the Bible out there for people throughout the ages. We are constantly, even if you wouldn't describe yourself as a Christian or don't know what you believe, isn't it true that we're always, we can't just live in this world without some sort of metaphysical map. So we are processing ultimate realities, even if we don't want to admit it all the time. And so if you're a follower of Jesus, what we are called to do is to align our metaphysical map, ultimate reality, how I live in this world with the truth of God's word. But what we do is like, that's fine as long as it is 
fitting like it was to Peter at first. But then when Jesus takes a turn that Peter was not expecting, he goes about editing Jesus and rebuking him. And we do that in our own ways. But Jesus had enough. He pushes back. Get behind me, Satan. <laughs> this, remember, this is the one he just renamed. Yeah, I know people call you one thing, Simon, but I'm going to call you the rock. Now, instantaneously, he's calling him Satan. Talk about whiplash, Jesus. You are a stumbling block to me. Stumbling block. Now, actually, in the original, which the New Testament, you know, is written Greek, the, the, the original there is, is a word, skandalizo, which is translated something that causes you to stumble. The word block is not there. I actually, the, the Leo-inspired version, I think it would be better translated stumbling rock because that imagery is actually used in the Bible earlier in the Old Testament, and it fits with the context. That Peter, one second, you are a, you are a bedrock and now you're a stumbling rock. How in the world is that possible? And think about that word scandalizo. What, can you imagine what English word comes to us from that? Scandal, or scandalize. What Jesus is saying, if, if I can tease it out just a little bit, is Peter, this is no small thing. You are absolutely scandalizing who I am. My mission in the world that, you know, it's ironic because the cross in the Roman culture was incredibly scandalous. If you were subject to execution by crucifixion, I mean, basically you're tarred and feathered. But now Jesus is saying, I'm going to embrace that. This is who I am. I'm going to embrace the shame and the scandal of all of this. Because the cross, he, he wasn't embarrassed about it. He didn't push it off to the margins. It wasn't incidental for Jesus, much less accidental. It was utterly central to who he was and what he came to do. It tells us what kind of Messiah he would be. He would, in fact, m remove all oppressive authorities eventually, but not through the strong arm power of a worldly leader, but one who would bend the knee and wash the feet, as we talked about recently. That he would serve us, and through his service, he would bring about that kind of messianic healing. And you might say, well, yeah, but it's kind of harsh that he's calling Peter Satan. I mean, my goodness. But there's a backstory here that's really important to grasp. So this is Matthew 16. Earlier in Matthew, Matthew 4, very beginning of Jesus' ministry. You know how he starts off his ministry? Not with a great advertising campaign promoting himself all over the place. He goes off by himself into the wilderness of Judea and fasts for 40 days. Imagine what you'd be like, <laughs> what I'd be like if I fasted for 40 days. I mean, you're completely weak. And at the end of that time, guess who so shows up? Our friend Satan. And he tempts Jesus. He tempts him. Remember, he's temp been tempted in every respect, but has never succumbed to it. And the ultimate temptation, he takes him, guess where, up way up on a high mountain and shows him all the kingdoms of the world and says, Jesus, I know you want to be king. I know you want to be that ultimate Messiah. And I'm going to give you all of these. You just got to do one small little thing. You've just got to bow the knee to me and worship me. What does Jesus say to him? Remember what he said to Peter? Get behind me, Satan. You know what he says to Satan? Get away from me, Satan. Because what was Satan offering in this proposition to Jesus? Jesus, I'm going to give you exactly what you've come to achieve but you're going to be able to do an in run on suffering and the cross. I'm going to get you where you need to go in a much safer route. I mean, it's much more efficient, Jesus. Why wouldn't you do this? Just that one little thing. You got to worship me. And this is where Jesus emphasizes from the very beginning of his ministry so that when we get to this point, we understand what Peter is doing. 
This is no trivial thing. He is verbalizing the same demonic assault that has been after him from day one. You don't have to suffer. You don't have to go to the cross. But Jesus is saying, no, this is what I'm about. I must go to Jerusalem. I must go to the cross. I must bear the judgment of the world so that you who come to me by faith who affirm that I am the Messiah, the Son of the living God, the Savior of the world who goes to the cross because when you put your trust in me, the judgment that should have fallen on you now falls on me, Jesus is saying, and instead, you receive my love, you receive, well, a new identity. You're a new person, just as Peter was. But it's wrestling from that point forward. That's why Jesus said, look, if you're really going to be one of my followers, then you've got to follow me where I'm headed. You've got to take up your cross and follow me wherever I go. It means a life of suffering. And boy, the last year has been about this. And some of you are in particular episodes of suffering right now that are extreme. Some of you will face suffering that you can align it very precisely with what you believe about Jesus. Regardless, the life of suffering, while we are trained by our culture to avoid it, to do an end run around it, we certainly don't invite it into our life. But Jesus says, follow me through your suffering because glory always awaits on the other side of the cross. On the third day, he was lifted up. See, this is how he'll make saints of us. This is how he will take the brokenness in our world, the brokenness in the church, the brokenness in you and me, and make it whole for his glory. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for showing patience to impetuous people like us, people who resemble Peter a lot more than we'd like to admit. We might have our days where there's the best of us that's being exemplified before others, but there's so much more behind the scenes. Oh Lord, thank you that you have come to people who are desperately needy of your healing and intervention in our life, and that you do that through your love and grace in Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.